We are in a study of the ministries of Elijah and Elisha. And we've been in this study for quite some time. We've taken some breaks to to follow the Lord and and do some different things in the midst of it. And um, Pastor Todd and I have been doing something that we have not done in 30, how many years have we been married? 32 years of marriage. We got married 32 years ago, and three months later, we started pastoring our first church together. And uh, the Lord just put this on Pastor Todd's heart over a year ago, that that he wanted the teaching gift and pastor and the prophetic gift that God had placed in me to come together. And he wanted us to begin to come together to prepare the messages, to seek the Lord together. And it has been powerful. I'm telling you, it has been powerful in our marriage. Like we already had a wonderful marriage, but if you want your marriage to go deeper and you want to become more unified, Dig into the Word of God together. And, and we've always read the Word together. That is a normal daily routine in the Hudnall household. Seldom does a day go by, almost never, that we don't come together to read the Word of God together and uh, to pray together, to pray for each other. But as we have been digging deeper during this season, it has been amazing and eye-opening. And in this series on Elijah and Elisha, it's called Take Up Your Mantle. We are learning how the Word of God, even from thousands of years ago, how many of you know the Bible says the Word of God is alive and full of power? It is alive. It is the living, breathing Word of God. It does not die. That's why, listen, this message today is all about beware of false prophets. Beware of false prophets and false teachers. And any person, whether it be a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher, whatever, any person that tells you you need to unhitch from portions of the scripture is a false teacher or a false prophet. The whole word of God was inspired to teach us to correct us when we're wrong, and to equip us with everything that we need to accomplish the mission and the purpose of God upon our lives. So we've been seeing throughout this whole series how it directly applies to our lives today, to our current circumstances, to the church today, and to our nation today. And you're going to see that very clearly again this morning as we go to 1 Kings chapter 22. Now, if you brought your Bible, lift your Bible up in the air with me. The scripture tells us the love of the truth is what keeps us from evil. The love of the truth is what keeps us from deception. And my dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you today And again and again and again, I plead with you, get into the word of God every day. Not for your information, but for your transformation. Amen? So we're going to go verse by verse through this chapter, 1 Kings 22. And I've got to tell you, it has been refreshing to sit down and spend hours with my husband because God has has, uh, gifted me um, one of the gifts. I don't say this in pride. I say this in humility. Listen, it took 30 years of walking with the Lord before I finally said, okay, Lord, I surrender to the gifting and the calling that you placed upon my life. And so I'm I'm bent prophetically. And Todd is bent in the teacher's realm. He is such a gifted and anointed teacher. And it has been very refreshing for me to go verse by verse with him, the teacher, and bring the, the prophetic revelation and the teaching gift together. So today we're in 1 Kings 22, and I'm going to ask you to turn to that chapter in your Bible. We're going to go verse by verse. Last night I was not here. Pastor Todd preached last night, and he preached an hour-long sermon. And... And I heard he was telling people, don't tell Kelly. (laughs) But I heard. (laughs) And I said, honey, imitation is the best form of flattery. (laughs) But today, I am not going to preach an hour-long sermon. I may have to cut part of it out, but I, I will not do that unless the Holy Spirit takes over and people are getting slain in the Spirit and the glory of God fills the temple 
Um, so don't, don't worry. Those of you whose hearts are racing and you're looking for the exits going, how do I get out of here? Just stay calm, be still, and know that he is God. 1 Kings 22 directly correlates to us today. And we're going to see that as we go through this. We've seen that Ahab is the most wicked ruler or king that Israel had ever had. And his wife Jezebel was even more wicked than Ahab. And the scripture teaches us that often when God has to judge a nation, because how many of you know God is not good if he does not judge sin and corruption and wickedness? So there comes a time, he's merciful, he's patient, he's long-suffering, but there comes a time when God must judge sin, and he must judge a nation. And oftentimes when he does, he gives them over to corrupt leaders. Sound familiar? If it doesn't, I don't know where you've been living. So this applies very directly to you and me today and where we're living. In 1 Kings 20, God gave Israel a miraculous victory over the Arameans. And after that battle, Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, had surrendered territory to Israel. But Israel failed to occupy the land. Another thing that sounds familiar, friends, we are living in a nation. We are living in the most amazing nation in the world. The home of the free, the land of the brave. Am I getting that turned around? It's close enough. <laughs> but, but we are living in the most amazing nation in the world. However, sadly, the body of Christ, God's sons and daughters, have failed to occupy the positions of leadership and authority in the nation. So it has been turned over to corruption, wickedness, and perversion. And that's why it's so important that every day we are praying and standing on 2 Chronicles 7.14, repenting of our sin to fail to occupy the land. And in 1 Kings 22, King Ahab, he's evil, But he sees the need to claim or occupy that land that they had failed to occupy previously. So go with me to verse 1. It says, now three years passed without war between Syria and Israel. So Syria and Israel had had three years of peace. And Ahab is gaining confidence with his former victory over Syria and other victories that he had won in battles with other nations. And he forgets that it was God who gave him the victory. And when we forget God, when we forget God is the one who gives us every victory and every gift that we have, every good and perfect gift comes down from above. When we forget God is the one who gives those those victories to us, we always fall into pride and pride always leads to destruction. Always. That's why on during this month of June, it is important as sons and daughters of God, that we stand in the gap for our nation. And while the majority participates in pride celebrations, we, God's sons and daughters, must come out and be separate. Amen? And, And we must be different. While they celebrate pride, we must humble ourselves before the Lord in repentance and in the fear of the God, in fear of God, crying out to God for mercy upon our land. So Ahab forgets it was God who gave him the victory. He falls into pride. And when you forget God, it always leads to pride. And that's what we're seeing in our nation today. We've forgotten God. America has forgotten God. And so now we celebrate what God hates. I love what Augustine said. He said, listen to this. You guys are going to love this. You are going to want to quote this. You're going to want to tweet it. You're going to want to post it on social media. I've already posted it this morning on Facebook, so you can get it from my Facebook. But Augustine said this. He said, it was pride that changed angels into devils. And it is humility that makes men as angels. I don't know about you, but I know for me and my house, we're going to follow the Lord. And we're going to humble ourselves before him. That's exactly what we see in our nation. As a nation celebrates pride, they look more and more like hell. And as God's people humble themselves before him, 
we look more and more like Jesus. Amen? And that's our goal. And God, we say, let it be so, let it be so. Verse two, then it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went down to visit the king of Israel. So Jehoshaphat's the king of Judah and Ahab, wicked Ahab, is the king of Israel. And so Ahab said to his servants, he said, do you know that Ramoth and Gilead is ours? But we hesitate to take it out of the hand of the king of Syria. So he's saying there's land over there that we have failed to occupy and now we're gonna go in and possess that land. But the problem is they've waited three years. And so now Ben-Hadad does not want to give it up. Ben-Hadad is not cool with this. Now, here is a lesson for all of us to learn from these first three verses in 1 Kings 22. Our first lesson is this. When God gives you a spiritual victory, when he gives you a healing, when he sets you free from pornography or drug addiction, or when he sets you free from, from I don't know what, what kind of bondage he set you free from, but when he gives you a victory... You must stand firm in that victory and you must continue to fight to hold on to that victory because the enemy will always come back to try to take back, to try to steal from you what God has given you. Come on, does anybody know what I'm talking about today? I've seen it happen again and again and again. That's why we do something called, we have a a, a curriculum called Break Free. It's a ministry path. Because if you've lived in this world very long at all, we all have things that we need to break free from. And so just to give you a forward glance into 2024, we are bringing break free back in 2024 for people that want to go through those those courses again to be delivered and set free from every trap and every demon, every plan, scheme, bondage, stronghold of the enemy. And then at the end, we have an encounter weekend where we see incredible supernatural deliverance in people where they are completely set free from the powers of darkness and they have victory and freedom in their lives. But we always follow up with a final session called staying free because you can get set free, but if you do not occupy the land, so to speak, and you do not fill yourself up with the word of God, his truth, and continue to stand to fight for your freedom, the enemy will come back in and steal it from you. So those of you, how many of you have ever been healed before? God has, you've experienced, look at that, hands up high, I have been healed by God so many times, I've lost count. But you, you know the enemy, how many of you have been healed and then later the enemy tried to bring symptoms back and tried to bring it back on you again? All right, and, and you know you have to fight to hold on to that healing, don't you? So keep fighting. Verse four, let's go on to verse four. So he, Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, will you go and fight with me? Will you go with me to fight at Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said, because Jehoshaphat is such a diplomatic, merciful, kind, vibe only kind of guy. Jehoshaphat says, I am as you are, King Ahab, and my people are as your people. My horses are your horses. And when I read that, I just think, ah, Jehoshaphat, you fool. On the surface, it looks good. Because he's complying. You know, they had that whole kind vibes thing, kind vibes only thing going back in Ahab's day. So that you didn't do anything to go against evil. You complied with evil and then it made you look good in the eyes of all the people. But it's very devastating as we're going to see with, with Jehoshaphat. It was a big mistake. So here's the next lesson that God teaches us through Jehoshaphat's mistake. And this is point number one. And uh, if you don't have a journal, I'm going to plead with you. Begin to bring a journal to church. It's like you're bringing your plate to the buffet. And you're saying, God, I don't want to miss out on anything good you have for me. So bring a journal. Or you can go to the Radiant app. And you can take notes on your, your smartphone. But point number one is this. Avoid ungodly alliances. Say it with me. Avoid ungodly alliances. Great damage is done by associating with the wrong people. Now, how many of you have lived that one out? Oh, boy. 
I, I love what Pastor Mark has said to the teenagers for years and years and years. I've heard this, and it has just stuck with me. He always tells the kids, show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. The people you align yourself with is very important because you will become like them. Jehoshaphat had no business partnering with evil King Ahab, none. But he thought, well, I have to look good in the eyes of the people and and I want to be kind, kind vibes only, right? And so sure, I'm going to partner with him. You never partner with evil, never And some of you need to learn this lesson before you make the same mistake or continue to make the same mistake you've already made in the past. And I want to speak to students. Students, where are you? Lift up your hands right now. Young people, kids, I want to speak to you right now and say you stop hanging out with wicked, immoral, ungodly people. And if you are one, stop it and repent in the name of Jesus before it's too late. If you think that you being godly like Jehoshaphat can align yourself with people who are wicked, corrupt, immoral, and ungodly, and it will not impact you, you're wrong. You're dead wrong. And that's why the Lord has said today, you must speak this message and speak it boldly. Some of you, you need to break up with people that are dragging you away from God. Some of you, you need to break away from those friendships and those relationships with people that are ungodly and wicked and immoral. I'll tell you, it breaks my heart to see young people passionately going after Jesus and then they align themselves with a corrupt, immoral student and then I hear them speaking profanity and talking, talking like hell. And I think, what happened to them? That's not who they are. But because of who they've aligned themselves with, they begin to become like the wicked person that they have aligned with. And God is saying today, this is your lesson. Lesson number one, avoid ungodly alliances. And you break them off, break them off today. And you say, well, Pastor Kelly, that's, those aren't very kind vibes I hear coming from the pulpit. What is it going to take to get people to wise up and realize you cannot be kind with demonic, the demonic realm? And when you align yourself with people that are bent on wickedness, I'm, not, I'm, t- I'm saying you pray for them, you reach out to them, you speak truth to them, you love them by all means, but you do not align with them and continue to be friends with them or you run with them. You do not do- avoid ungodly alliances because you will become like the people you associate with. As Pastor Mark says, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. So some of you need to break it off today. And listen, if you think you're being kind by aligning with a wicked person, an immoral person, you're not being kind. You're, you're being wicked towards that individual because you're patting them on the back, rubbing their little head and saying, oh, sweetie, you just keep living like hell and, and I'm going to keep being your buddy and I'm going to keep running with you and, and I'll partner a little bit here and a little bit there with your wickedness. That is so wrong on so many levels. It's wrong for you and it's wrong for that individual. That that individual needs to know that living for hell, living like hell, will lead them to hell. And so if you align with them, all you're doing is justifying actions and a lifestyle that would lead them into destruction. Give God praise for his truth that sets us free. So 2 Corinthians 6.14 in the New Testament, we're told, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness? And listen, I want to say just because someone says they are a Christian does not mean they are a Christian. You will know them by their fruit. And if someone says they're a Christian, but hell is coming out of their mouth and hell, their lifestyle looks like hell and wickedness and darkness, they are not a true follower of Jesus. And we love them enough to tell them, buddy, you better get your life in order. We have a member of our church who was killed in a motorcycle accident last night. 30 some years old. Had no, he had no clue when he got on that motorcycle, he was getting ready to go be with Jesus. 
And listen, those of you, especially all of us, but young people in the room, you think you have your whole life to get it together. You don't know how long you have. And so I beg you on behalf of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, repent and get your life right today. And those of you who are godly but running with the ungodly, repent and break off those relationships today. In Jesus' name. Okay. I just can't help it. The prophet just constantly comes out. Verse 5. Also Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel. He's, so Jehoshaphat comes to Ahab and says, Sure, Ahab, I will align with you because I'm a kind, guy, kind vibes only guy. And so he aligns with this wicked evil king. And then he says, But please inquire for the word of the Lord today. Well, I think it's great and it's commendable that Jehoshaphat saying we need to pray, but Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat made a very bad, grave mistake. Jehoshaphat should have prayed and inquired of the Lord before he aligned himself with wicked Ahab. So don't make the same mistake. That takes us to point number two. Can you believe it? It's only 10 o'clock and we're already at point number two. Give glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So number two is this, pray first. Say it with me, pray first. Turn to your neighbor on the right and say, pray first. Then turn to your neighbor on the left and say, pray first. If Jesus is truly our Lord, we need to consult with him before any important decisions in our lives. And sadly, so many people just rush into things. If a situation seems good, they go for it. That's what Jehoshaphat did. It seemed good, seemed good to him. Yeah, sure, we'll align with you, Ahab. And he rushed right into it, and the, 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 the consequences were grave. Listen, not everything that looks good or seems good is God. So we must ask for God's guidance, grace, favor, blessing, and anointing on everything we do. Let me tell you, when I saw the chapter that we were coming into, last week it was 1 Kings 21, before that, 1 Kings 20, and I went to Pastor Todd, you're going to be shocked, Jen, because he's mercy teacher, and I'm, I'm bold. It's not that I'm not merciful, but I'm prophetic. And when I saw what we were coming up on, I said, oh, Todd, are you sure we want to teach on this? And he said, I prayed, and I, I know this is what the Lord wants us to teach on. So we're going with God, hallelujah. Pray first. Always remember to pray first. Before you start your day, pray first. I, I say, don't get out of bed without praying first. And without saying, Lord, lead me throughout this day today. God, I'm your servant. Holy Spirit, I'm working with you. Teach me, lead me, guide me, instruct me. Before you eat a meal, pray first. Before you travel, pray first. I've taught our kids as we have taught Faith to Drive, and now we're teaching Luke. The very first thing you do when you get in the car, before you even fasten that seatbelt, is you pray first. You pray and you plead the blood of Jesus over that vehicle and over your life. Pray first. Before you go to work, before you go to school, pray first. Before you go into a meeting, pray first. Because if you don't, you may make some stupid, foolish, bonehead decision that you will live to regret later. Am I telling the truth? Before you send a text or an email, pray first. You, guys, I have written emails that are still in my draft box. <laughs> Emails that I wrote, and then I stopped and prayed, and the Lord did not release me to send them. Pray first. Before you go to bed at night, pray first. And certainly before any big decision, pray first. In Psalm 123, verse 2, it says, Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy upon us. Now, I'm going to share with you a vision God gave me in 2016. Some of you have heard this vision again and again. It's okay. You can hear it again and again and again and again because the Lord continues to bring it back to me again and again and again. I'll never forget it. We were living in, on Oak Meadow Drive in Pine Creek. And I was in the closet. I was in our closet that day. 
And the Lord gave me an open vision, and it was so unique. I have never, I mean, I've had visions where angels come, and they transport me to, to see prophetic streams and oaks of righteousness. And I mean, I've had so many amazing dreams about America and the flag and the storm. And I've, but this one was so different. In this vision, what the Lord showed me, and we were going through a time of very big decisions, I saw a German shepherd, and Todd and I used to have German shepherds. We had two 90-pound German shepherds, and we were covered with hair everywhere, everywhere we went. But I saw in this vision a German shepherd, and he looked so regal as he sat straight up on his haunches. And there, this, this is what I'm telling I'm telling you, this was so unique. Right under his nose on the floor was a plate with a juicy red T-bone steak. Isn't that crazy? I'm telling you this, but I, I, no one can convince me. I'm, I had an open vision in my closet. And I saw that German shepherd, this, the stake underneath him, and I see him staring, and I knew he was staring at his master. And even though that steak was there, he knew it was there. He knew that steak was good. He knew it was juicy. He knew it was for him. He knew, he smelled it. It smelled good. It looked good. Oh, he wanted it, but he did not move a muscle. His eyes stayed fixed on his master. And he would not move a muscle until the master gave him the signal and then he could go. And that day, I said, Lord, that was so weird. And he said, Kelly, that's how my children must be with me. Just because something looks good, just because a situation sounds good, just because it seems right, you do not move a muscle until you have the master's green light to go for it. Amen? So go ahead, give him praise. So Jehoshaphat is now being like the German shepherd, but it's a little too late. He's going to go through some pain. So he's wanting to inquire of the Lord. And verse 6 says, Then the king of Israel, that's Ahab, he gathered the prophets together, about 400, and he said to them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to fight, or shall I refrain? So they said, Go up, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. Now, these 400 prophets were false prophets, and we know that because they had cancel culture in that day in Israel. And so all the true prophets were in hiding. The true prophets had been canceled. Their voices had been silenced. But he had 400 false prophets that were all on the king's payroll. So they would say only what they knew the king wanted to hear. Notice in verse 5, it says, well, let's see, did we read verse? Yeah, we already read verse five. In verse five, when the word Lord is in all caps, anytime you see, and highlight that in your Bible, anytime you see the word Lord in all caps, it's because the translators want you to know this isn't just any Lord. This isn't just any God. This is Yahweh. This is the almighty God, the one true God, the only God. When it's only the first letter, it's for Adonai. And Adonai is a title or a position, like Lord is a title or a position. So Jehoshaphat uses Yahweh. Because Jehoshaphat knows these are false prophets, and they say they're prophesying in the name of the Lord, but Jehoshaphat knows better. He knows all the true prophets have been silenced in their hiding. And he says, he says this, is there anyone else? We're, we're going to see that in a few minutes, but let's go do another important lesson from Ahab's mistake. And that's number three, beware of itching ears. Beware of itching ears. 2 Timothy 4 tells us in the last days that people will have itching ears and they, they will heap teachers to themselves. And boy, do we not ever have access to find every kind of message, sermon, teacher that we can find on the internet that will appease and soothe our itching ears. 
You can find a false prophet, a false teacher anywhere now today. It's right at your fingertips. But that will soothe your conscience and make you feel good about going in a way that you know is not the way the Lord wants you to go. Is anybody with me? Beware of itching ears. So all these prophets are telling Ahab what his itching ears want to hear. They're not telling him what he needs to hear. And people do that today. Many pastors are doing that today. Instead of getting in their pulpits and preaching the truth that will set people free, instead of preaching the truth that could turn our nation back to God, they're preaching what the people's itching ears want to hear. And that's exactly what was happening with Ahab and all of these false prophets who were on the king's payroll. Verse 7, Jehoshaphat says, Is there not still a prophet of the Lord here? That the Lord Yahweh, that we may inquire of him? Listen, true prophets don't speak what itching ears want to hear. And that's why... People may come to Radiant and be uncomfortable because we speak what the Lord tells us to speak. Listen, we don't get up here and preach these bold sermons because we love preaching bold sermons that make people uncomfortable. We do it because we're in submission to God. And we know there's always a remnant of those who will passionately follow him regardless of the cost. True prophets speak the word of the Lord and true prophets focus on righteousness, holiness, and truth that leads to repentance and salvation. Come on, give God glory for true prophets. And you know, all of this that we read in 1 Kings 22 is very similar to what we see with Jeremiah. When all of the prophets were, were speaking, they were false prophets, and they were, said they were speaking in the name of the Lord, and they were declaring, peace, peace, prosperity. Maybe you've heard some pink-haired prophets, prophets say, just eat cake. I'm going to tell you something, and yes, I will. I'll make some people mad by saying this. But we live in a time where false prophets are making a mockery of the word of God. And they're making a mockery of the office of the prophet. When you hear prophets telling you ridiculous stuff that does not line up with scripture. Like jello mountains in heaven. And like Elvis and and Michael Jackson hosting concerts in heaven. Riding T-Rexes. Listen friends, you tell me what Does that profit a person? It doesn't. It creates chaos and confusion and a distraction. And when you have people that say, I'm a prophet of God. I'm a prophet of God. Listen to me. God speaks to me. And what they speak causes confusion. And it distracts you from righteousness, holiness, and truth. It distracts you from the truth of God's word. It distracts you from the harvest when it distracts you from reaching the lost and rescuing, the, rescuing souls, you know this person is not a true prophet of God. Come on. Come on. It's time. If we don't call the pro- false prophets out, then we will be held accountable. This is so important in the day that we live. So verse 8. So Ahab says to, to Jeho- Jehoshaphat, listen to this. Well, there is still one man. He had one true prophet in prison, in the king's prison. And he said, his name is Micaiah. And I know we can inquire of the Lord, Yahweh, if we call on Micaiah. And then Ahab says, but I hate him. I hate him. Listen, true prophets are hated. True prophets are not popular. They're hated. True prophets don't have the people going, oh, prophet of God, prophet of God, give, tell me my fortune, prophet of God, tell me what is God saying, what is God doing? Come on, that's nonsense, and we need to break free from it in the church today. You go to God, you go to your prayer closet, in fasting and prayer, in weeping and repentance, and you say, oh God, speak to me through your word, and you say, Holy Spirit, speak to me. You don't go running around to prophets, so-called prophets of God that are leading people into nonsense and foolishness. Come on, give God praise for the truth. (sighs) 
Oh, God, forgive us. So Ahab says, I hate Micaiah because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. False prophets hate it when true prophets call out their evil. Listen, that's exactly what's happening here. And over the years, Todd and I have literally had people who've told us they hate us. Not because of anything we've done, but because we speak the truth that makes them uncomfortable. Friends, we have had people threaten us and literally tell us simply because we have responded like Mario Murillo when he was on a talk show. Some of you will remember him sharing this. And they said, well, Mario, what's your opinion on gay marriage? And Mario said, I don't have an opinion on gay marriage, but let me tell you what God says about it. If Jesus is Lord, you're not. If Jesus is Lord, I'm not. So I don't get to pick and choose, Andy Stanley, what I unhitch from and what I hold on to. And every, people need to know Andy Stanley is a false teacher in our day. And I love him and I pray for him. But if we don't start calling it out, the masses are going to be continually drawn. They're blind guides leading the blind and they both fall into a pit. It's time. It's time for all of us to rise up and be a lightous in this day. And to call out the darkness and the wickedness, the nonsense that is keeping people from the truth. So he hated Micaiah, but in actuality, Ahab's problem wasn't really with Micaiah, it was with God, because Micaiah was just God's messenger. And I am only to verse nine, and it's time to close. Woo, I can see why Todd preached an hour long sermon last night. So Holy Spirit, show me what to hit on as we close here today. I have to share with you something that happened to me several years ago. It was near Father's Day. <laughs> and um, I went to Kohl's. I won't shop at Kohl's anymore. They have a whole line of pride LGBTQ, pride baby clothes. They are trying to force immorality on our children and on the children of our nation. And friends, if you have kind vibes only, you're going to stand before God one day and have to give an account to him for why you didn't protect those children and why you didn't stand up it's time for us to vote with our pocketbook. And I, I don't care. Hey, the children of Israel, their clothing and their shoes lasted for 40 years in the wilderness. So I say, God, you did it before, do it again. And we'll just hold on to that money and give it to build this building right here. Come on, I should have heard a better shout than that for that right there. But um, I, I went in, I had two coupons I got in the mail. It was like $10 off of a $50 purchase. And I thought, whoo, because I love coupons. And um, anybody else love coupons? So I thought, well, I wonder if I can bring both and I can do two $50 purchases and get $20 off. So I go up and I ask the cashier and she acted terrified. And she said, I am so sorry, but no, you can't do that. We're only allowed to allow one coupon per customer. And I said, oh, okay, that's fine, I understand. And she said, oh, thank you for being so nice. There are times when kind vibes are necessary, but not when you're dealing with demons and wickedness. And um, she said, oh, thank you for being so kind, for being so nice. And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, well, there was a person, a customer before you that she lit into me. And she started calling me names and cussing me out because I told her we weren't allowed to let her use two coupons. And I said, I am so sorry that happened to you. And I said, that should not have happened to you. And I said, don't worry and don't take it personally. You didn't make the rules. You're just the messenger. <laughs> and so I just blessed her. And I got into my car. And I'm pulling my seatbelt over to click it. And the Lord st starts to speak to me. And he said, Kelly, that's exactly what happens to you. He said, you didn't set the rules. You didn't set the boundaries and the guidelines. I did. But because you're my messenger, you're hated and you're persecuted, you're threatened. And he said, but my grace is sufficient for you. And I am the Lord. Give him praise for that today. So when people hate you, like Ahab hated Micaiah for speaking the truth, consider it all joy. 
And remember in Luke 6, Jesus said, woe to you when all men speak well of you. And you know what? I think there are the majority of Christians today, their whole goal is they want everybody to speak well of them. And friends, that is a demonic, wicked trap of the enemy. Now, I'm not saying we go around and we make people mad. No, we're to be righteous and holy. We're to live like Jesus. But remember, Jesus, he had the crowds flocking to him. And then the more he preached the truth, the crowds thinned out. And there was one time in the Gospels when he started talking to them about things like, anyone who's going to be my disciple must deny himself take up his cross and follow me. Listen, where is that in the Christian church in America today? And then he said things like, if you're going to follow me, you you will need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And, And people got so freaked out by what Jesus was saying that the crowds thinned out. And, and dwindled down. And then Jesus looks at the 12 disciples and he says, what about you? Are you going to leave too? And they said, Lord, where would we go? You have the words of life. Listen, there's always a remnant. Don't go with the majority. If you're on the road, the wide path that the majority's on, the Bible warns, Jesus warns, that is a path that leads to destruction. Get off of it. But if you're on a narrow path that's difficult and there's just a minority, you know you're on the right path. So don't go with the crowd or you will be very disappointed and devastated in the end. So in verse 10, so what happens next? I'm just going to have to tell you the story. Uh, I'm only on verse 11. Oh, for crying out loud. (laughs) So in verse 11, they, so the two kings come together and they're sitting on thrones on, in, in the threshing floor and they bring the 400 false prophets to come and perform before them. And one false prophet, Zedekiah, son of Kaniah, comes and he made horns of iron and he said, Thus says the Lord, with these horns you shall gore the Syrians until they are destroyed. Now, horns speak of strength and he was most likely speaking of Israel and Judah coming together to destroy the king of Syria and to take the land. But he was a false prophet. And all the other prophets joined in and they started prophesying along with him, even using the name of Yahweh. Now I want to read 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4 to you. Listen to this. This warns, this is our day we're being warned about. The time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine but they'll flock to the places with their little itching ears to find pastors and preachers that will make them comfortable in their sin and say what they want to hear. Come on, are you with me today? But according to their own, own desires, they, won't, they don't, won't want sound doctrine. And so they'll look for pastors that say unhitch from the portions of scripture that make you uncomfortable. They'll look for them and they'll flock. That's where you'll see the crowds. The crowds will flock to the false teachers that soothe their itching ears because it says they have itching ears. They will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Do not be turned aside to fables. And I love you enough to tell you, listen, prophets don't speak the word because they, the, the truth because they hate. We speak the truth because we love And when you hear prophets prophesying nonsense, like we have heard in recent days, this is what we're warned about in 2 Timothy 4. People that don't want sound doctrine will be turned away to fables. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. But pastors today in most of America's churches are silent They're telling the people what the people want to hear instead of telling them what they need to hear. Just comply. Just be silent. Kind vibes only. Don't speak the truth that that could cause somebody to get angry with you. Listen, those are all lies. Those are all false prophets. Go back and read the Bible. You will see again and again and again. That's what the false prophets did throughout history. The true prophets spoke the truth. The true prophets said, do not comply. The true prophets were like Esther and Mordecai and Jeremiah and Isaiah. The true prophets were like Micaiah. 
And let, let me tell you what happens to Micaiah. But verse number four, point number four is refuse to be silenced. So Ahab sends a messenger to the prison to get a Micaiah. And the little messenger boy says, all right, Micaiah, come on. The king has called for you. But he says, now, Micaiah, all the other prophets are saying kind things to the king. And now you need to do the same. You make sure you say kind things to the king also. What is that? That's cancel culture. And friends, in case you're not aware of it, we have Christian cancel culture today where they're doing the same thing. Now, oh, kind, kind words only, Micaiah. So Micaiah comes before Ahab and Ahab, you know, tells him to prophesy. And, and so he's sarcastic. Micaiah is sarcastic. And it's very likely he was a student of Elijah. I love that. Remember Elijah on Mount Carmel when they're cutting themselves and trying to get the bales to answer them? And, and uh, Elijah says, well, maybe your God is on vacation. Maybe your God's sitting on the toilet. Maybe he's constipated. I mean, he's sarcastic because he knows this is idiocy. This is nonsense. And so Micaiah comes and Ahab says, what should I do, Micaiah? And he said, yeah, 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 go up and take, take the land. God will give you the victory. And Ahab knew he wasn't being honest. He wasn't being truthful. So he comes back and he rebukes him. Listen, I want to say again and again and again, beware of false prophets. Beware of pro false prophets. Number four, again, refuse to be silenced. This is so important. And this is why we keep saying it again and again. Some of you will remember when Eric Metaxas was with us a few months ago. And he talked about, and he wrote about this in his book, Bonhoeffer, that during the rise of Hitler and the Nazis in Germany, like today, the church was divided. Listen to this. About a sixth were supportive of Hitler. A sixth of the church was supportive of Hitler. Do you ever think, how can you be a Christian and be supportive of the Biden administration? Same thing. Same thing's happening today. And about a sixth stood against Hitler. That's us, the holy rebels. About a sixth stood against it. But the majority stayed in the middle, and they refused to take a stand. They may have known things weren't right, but they said nothing, and they did nothing. And listen, their silence led to the extermination of six million Jews and the horrors of World War II. Beware of false prophets. This is the word of the Lord to the church in America today. And Micaiah then says, as the Lord lives, whatever the Lord Yahweh says to me, that I will speak. And that's exactly what he does. And so I've got to figure out how to close this in the next 30 seconds. <laughs> You'll have to go home and read the rest of the story for yourself with the Holy Spirit and let him take you deeper. Pastor Todd probably got a lot further. So you can also watch his version of the message online later. But God is calling all of us to be truth speakers, to speak the truth with boldness and do not allow cancel culture in, in this Marxist society or in Christian cancel culture. Do not be silenced. Oh no, we're in an Esther moment. And God's calling all of us to be Esthers and Mordecais, to come out of the silence, to break the silence, and to, to be like Nehemiah and fight for our families, fight for our children, fight for your grandchildren. Come on, Pastor Mark, fight for your grandchildren. Number five, the last one, do not allow your heart to be hardened. Because that's what we see with Ahab. Ahab had chance after chance after chance to repent, but he hardened his heart and he hardened his heart and he hardened his heart and he was destroyed. And you'll have to read the end of the story yourself to see how it happened. All right, let's pray. Father, this was a lot. An entire chapter that is packed full of so many truths that apply to us in the time that we're living in today. And Lord, I pray that as each of us go home and we read the rest of the story, that you will speak to all of us and that we will be like Elijah. We will be like Jeremiah and Micaiah and Isaiah. We will be 
We will be true men and women of God, true prophets of God. You said in the last days, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. But Lord, you've called every one of us to prophesy truth, even when it cost us. And so, Lord, I pray today that faith would rise up in the heart of every one of your sons and daughters and a holy boldness that the lion of the tribe of Judah would roar through your sons and daughters and roar against the enemy that has come to steal, kill, and destroy and to rescue, rescue the perishing, rescue the lost, rescue the deceived and the broken. In Jesus' name.